I will never be the chosen one I will never be the pretty one With the clean tattoos and the unused shoes That only get one on stage I will never be the sure thing But I'm content being the pure thing With my heart on my sleeve While I sing like I breathe Fighting for it I deserve all right, you're listening to KDVS 90.3 FM. I'm here with Bump and Uglies. How you doing, dude? I'm good, man. Good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So uh, let's get a proper introduction. What's your full name? Brandon you from Brandon Hardesty or, or Mr. Mr. Bump and Uglies. If you Mr. Want to. Bump and yeah. Uglies. <laughs> and you're coming from Maryland. Yeah, Annapolis, Maryland. Dude, that's a long drive. <laughs> yeah, well, we we flew. So. Right on, right on. So uh, I see that you just released a new album, an acoustic uh, single, correct? Yeah, well, it's the first single off of an upcoming acoustic album. The song's called Underdog, and then the record's going to be called Underdog as well. Nice. Yeah. Okay. When are we going to expect that to come out? I want to say mid, uh, mid-August, mid I think, is, is the record. Okay. Actually, it might be... I know we got another single coming out in a week or so, and then I think... The, I want to say the record's like a month after that, so maybe September. Nice. I should know this, but I don't. <laughs> hey, man, you're busy. So... Uh, you're coming from Maryland. I gotta ask right out of the gate. Have you seen the show The Wire? Oh yeah, like three times. Yeah. What do you think about it? It's great. I think <laughs> first season and the third season and the fourth season are, are it. And then second season's cool. Fifth season's ridiculous. Second season is is, is all right. But yeah, man, I, I've been having that debate with my girlfriend myself because I'm putting her on the show. Mm-hmm. And it, it's different. It's definitely different. It's funny though, because being from Maryland, I got a lot of friends who work down at the docks, so like they love that. Like they, they that's like their favorite season because that's like all about them. But yeah. I just think like it's it's slower compared to you know you're going from like the crazy like crack dealing in the first season to just like dock worker drama. And, right. Um, it's just different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so uh, you've been in the business for a while since 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Explain a little bit about that process of becoming a professional. Because at the station, we're an independent radio station. We get a lot of kids coming, a lot of uh, aspiring artists. Describe when you knew you're a professional, what that looks like, and what advice would you give to young kids who are aspiring? I mean, it's it, it can't be about the money like at all. Like because you're going to constantly need to reinvest money into like getting more gear and and doing more things like you know like we never had anyone that helped us out with money so like the whole thing's been like self-financed like by myself and essentially and then the band and like the gigs that we would do back in the day we would just do bar gigs to make however much money we could and then reinvest that into the band for studio time and then like van payments and then slowly but surely like more gear like even at the stage we're at now like you know, and when we're when we're like normally doing our our touring, like we have a trailer that has all our our gear in it. You know, like like an in ear monitor system where it's totally contained. But when we fly, we don't get to fly with that stuff. So it's like it's a totally different experience playing a fly date to playing a club date. But like, there's a way to do that. There's a way to like fly and still use in ears. But it's like you have to buy another six, seven thousand dollars worth of gear. You know what I mean? So it's right. like just as it, I feel like it never stops. Like as you grow, you're gonna need to just consistently reinvest more money in it into it. So it's like y- you need to. I, I just uh, the, treat the, it like a business. It, it's of. well, it is a business. You have to treat it like a business, or you're not gonna make it work. Uh, essentially, it's like if if you're doing it to make a living off of of solely like playing music or what, like that, that needs to be the last priority. Like the the first priority needs to be making it happen, and then you just got to do what other side hustles you got to do to make it happen until then you know like obviously the goal is eventually you want to be making enough money off it to be sustainable but it's it's i feel like any small business is, is going to be a money suck for a long long time that's that's important i feel like a lot of people should hear that because they gotta appreciate the grind of what it takes to get here how many festivals have you been in so far like ever I, I don't know somewhere between shitload, huh? Yeah, somewhere between a hundred and a hundred million. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like a lot. Like it all runs together. I've been doing this for like fifteen years. So. Yeah. So, uh, have you seen the the reggae genre change in the past 10, 15 years? Yeah, a lot. It's, I mean, you kind of fall into that trifecta of you know punk, ska, reggae. 
I you know I, I kind of think of us more as like reggae adjacent like we we kind of play reggae you know what I mean we don't really do like reggae like when I think of reggae I think of like one drops and like classic reggae rhythms and we're we're just more way more on like the hip hop side of it um, kind of like hip hop drums with you know like the way Sublime did it right um, and uh, yeah you know like we definitely had like do more like ska punk and like hip hop and you know like reggae quote unquote. But it's yeah. I would definitely say like the evolution of the genre over the last ten years. It's it's become way more like like pop oriented. I think in a lot of ways, um, a big emphasis on like big production as opposed to like you know the, there's a lot more like programmed kind of beat driven things as opposed to like an emphasis on like the live band setting. Um, right. And it's uh, I mean that's just kind of what we're seeing now. You know, I feel like it's it's just like anything else where it's like. The, it's constantly evolving and changing. Uh, talk to me about the band a little bit. So you have a couple of bandmates. Um, how did you meet them? How do you pick your people? You know, who do you know? Who to well, perform well with? Wolfie's the, I've been playing with him the longest and he played in a, a Southern rock band out of Annapolis that I met him when we were doing open night mics back in the day. And he left that band and I needed a bass player. Um, so that was like, way back. Yeah. That was like 2010 or some, something like that. Um, my drummer was playing in a, in a, like a punk reggae band out of Philly that we just would see torn, you know, and same story. He left that band. We needed a drummer, so we linked up. Ethan, um, my keyboard player, and Will, my um, tenor sax player, both just from around the way, linked up with them when I was, you know, because we were a three-piece forever. But as the band grew, um, I just, you know, we, I knew them from around the way and brought them in. Ben, my percussion player. We do, at this point, we do like 75% of our dates with him, but when we're like out west and we're in like a rental, like a, you know, it's called a bandwagon, which is like a small tour bus, it's like a RV or something. Um, those only have nine bunks, so we don't have enough bunks to bring him on that, but when we're out east and we're using vans and stuff, you know, Ben does all our dates with us, but I, I've known him since high school, so it was like, as soon as I got to the point where I was ready to bring on a percussion player, I just hit him up, I was like, yo, you wanna, and he's kind of a pirate, just by, by life you know so he, right he was on. down okay so uh what does collaboration mean to you are you hoping to do any collaborations in the future i love collaboration direction? yeah like I, I think it's cool but like my philosophy on it like there's a lot of people who just want to do it as like like a transactional kind of thing where it's like you know like i'm gonna put this person on my song because it's gonna look good on spotify and get me streams or it's like i want to look it's it's like a more of a business kind of thing right whereas for me i i want to do it Strictly, I want to work with people that I like are my friends because it's fun making music with your friends or people who I'm like really into their shit. Like I don't ever want to like collab just because it makes sense from the business end. If that makes sense, that's respect. Yeah, you got to keep music first. Yeah, you just. I mean, the art needs to come first. I think. Right on. So describe a little bit about the music making process. How do you know when you're done with the song? You know, uh, describe the the progression of making a song, and then how do you know when you're well? I mean, it's, it's different for everyone else, but for this band, I mean, I, I write everything on an acoustic guitar in my basement. Like, I, I just write a bunch of songs, and I make demos on my my smartphone. I usually get together with TJ, my drummer, and then we'll fuck around and make other demos that are like kind of produced with like drums and, and acoustic. Then you know, send that to the rest of the band, and we get in the studio and we we just track it. You know, um, and a lot of a lot of it is built in the studio as far as like the layers go and whatnot but we always, we always go in with the skeleton um, of what the song is going to be based off the acoustic stuff that I wrote okay right on uh, I heard a couple younger bands say that they think they could get away with making a song with just three chords a simple chord progression you think that's possible I mean yeah a lot of the most successful songs in the world are just three songs like that's like very much pop it's very much I mean honestly like a lot of the reggae shit's two chords you know what I mean like it's I think it's less about I mean think of it like soup or like cooking and stuff it's like the, the best dishes aren't the most complicated recipes you know a lot of times simplicity is best like I'm, I'm big on lyrics like I think you know like it's all it all carries um, importance to it but I mean uh, there's no right or wrong way to write a song you know right do you believe in mistakes? Yeah, definitely. Are they good or bad? Are they welcomed in the, in I, the studio? I think they're unavoidable, and I think the biggest thing you can do is just learn from them. I think we're all constantly learning, and I think 
like the best thing you can do in life is kind of like challenge yourself to, to grow and when you do that you're going to make mistakes and uh, I mean all the best you know it's all part of the learning process I think you got to embrace them and just shake them off when they happen right on so what's next for Bumpin' Uglies what's your guys' next performance we're flying home on s tomorrow and then Next weekend, we're in New England. We got three dates. We're doing uh, Rhode Island, Portland, Maine, and uh, this suburb of Boston. That's, that's amazing to me, man, because I never really envisioned the East Coast having that type of It's funny, audience. man. It's funny because, like, a lot of people don't get that, like, for a long time. You know, like, it, it's been an interesting story being, um, doing this genre of music and being from the east coast because everywhere we would go people would think we're from california and i'm like very proud to be from maryland and um there's definitely like a very thriving scene over there like there's people and like i i, I define that based off of like the fact that there's like bands that are doing it um like a lot of different bands from all up and down the east coast and in the midwest that are doing it with different kind of different sounds and different textures to it and there's a lot of different markets up there where with fans that like want to come out and, and see the shows you know what i mean right so, so it's like there's definitely a thriving a thriving scene over there i think there's a thriving scene in this country but i mean the, the, the east coast is a big part of it for sure have you gone international yet um no we just did i mean we did some shit in mexico but that's like that's pretty cool my whole thing is like i mean really like the the way like you should treat touring is like you don't want to like do too much too quick so i'm trying to get the continental United States to the point where we're making like a solid living and right. then you like the idea is you cut you know because we're on the road like half the year right now so like I'm, I'm 37 I got two kids like I, I don't want to be doing that forever <laughs> you know yeah, I want to I want to cut back on the amount that we're on the road um, eventually but like you know when we get to the point we can cut back cut back on the United States that's when we can start thinking about adding in like international stuff like Europe or Australia or Japan you know right. whatever is the audience there do you think what or internationally or, yeah I mean, I th there's music fans all around the country, you know? Like, I mean, all around the world. Like, every, like, I've got friends that have done touring in Japan, and they say it's, like, the coolest shit they've ever seen. Like, and, and I know a lot of bands, more so in the rock genre, that kill it in Europe, and they don't do well in the United States at all, and they're from the United States, but they go over to Europe to kill it. Like, I don't know, like, the whole reason... Like, I love writing songs, and I love playing music, but the whole... One of the reasons I wanted to start doing this was just to see shit, you know, so like I've never been to Europe and I, you know, I really want to go over there and, and take it all in. I'll, I'd like to get paid to do it eventually. And Hell yeah, that's just, tight. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right on. So, uh, is there anything else that you want to promote before I close it out? Yeah, I mean, we got our own festival we put on in Bedford, Pennsylvania no called, called Weekend at Wolfie's. It's the, um, it was the second weekend of June this year. I think it's going to be right around there. Um, next year and it's it's cool you know it's DIY and, and it's a really wholesome event and I would encourage people to check that out weekend at Wolfie's mm -hmm. uh, okay before I I, I got to delve into that <laughs> how'd you get into that is, that must be really stressful are it, you it is man we, it, yeah well like it was it was my idea to do that like it's all I mean like once again like I said like this band started off and it was like self-financed and it's like I've been you know I've always had kind of like an entrepreneurial mind and as you get deeper into it it's just the way to make a living out of playing music is like finding different ways to make money, you know? So like putting on a festival is a really cool way to do that if you think you can sell the tickets, you know? So like it was five years ago, I think we did it for the first time and we had just started working with our current manager and it was like when shit really started clicking for us, he had experience putting on a festival. And I knew at that point, like I had done enough like like research into our, our fans and whatnot that we could sell the tickets to like you know because it's expensive to do it i think the first year it cost us like 40 50 grand to do it this last year it cost us like 100 grand to do it you know it's like it's, it's a very expensive risk to do but like you know you could potentially make enough money off that to like really subsidize the business for you know what i'm saying like like be on the road less eventually like right. and at the same time like you're, you're doing this really cool event, but you're also providing like a really cool experience for the people who come, which is like, like a big thing for me is like curating the vibe and like the atmosphere, you know? Right. Right. Sounds to me that you're very enterprising. You got some business plans in the future. I mean, man. you gotta be, if you, places. you gotta be, if you're trying to make a living out of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's important for these young kids to hear though, man. Cause you know, I get a lot of kids coming from Reno, SoCal, NorCal, and they're just, 
trying to make a name for themselves. And I don't think they realize that you got to promote yourself. There's a, there's well, a you business got, behind the, it. The biggest thing, too, you can do about this is, like, take merch seriously because we make way more money off merch than we do off playing music. Merch. Yeah. yeah. And, like, we, I treat our merch shit like a clothing store. Like, every quarter we have, like, new stuff rolling out. And, like, if you can develop a kind of fan base that like you have a personal relationship and they believe in what you're doing and they support you then they're going to support they're going to show you that support through buying the merch that's smart man. so you got to just constantly give them new ways to do that right repping your name really yeah well, it's, 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 a, it's a win-win it's yeah. advertisement and it's it's you know it's cash flow there you go yep all right man well thank you for your time yeah man uh, thanks thanks for having me i could probably keep talking to you forever but i don't want to talk your ears off <laughs> oh you're good you're good appreciate it man thank you yeah, cheers. <laughs>